All right, welcome to Ponce Church and welcome to Little City Church in Pennsylvania. Praise the Lord. All right, did your parents ever say, because I told you so? Have you ever heard that? Because I, that's kind of universal, right? Because I told you so. Well, kids don't, don't seem to like that answer, but they do seem to like, you know, we, we've had two boys and a bunch of grandkids and uh, they see, kids like to seem they seem to like to want to ask why. They really enjoy asking why, isn't that right? If you've been around Kylan much, uh, Kylan, he loves to ask why. He, he will ask you why like 10 times in a row. You know, why, why, why? Just have it keep going. They, they like to ask why. Well, as a parent, you know, you get a little tired of that after a while. You can only answer why so many times. And at some point, you just say, because I said so. Because I said so. And hopefully that ends the conversation. It, it may or may not. But uh, <clears throat> kids ask why, and they ask why at a, at a very young age. I was actually talking to uh, another one of our grandchildren that live in Pennsylvania, and he's, how old, how old is he, like three, maybe? Dietrich, you know how old he is? Again, we have so many, they're all about the same age, you know. So uh, they were up here for a wedding and we, uh, it was kind of rainy out, or similar to like today, it was kind of rainy out. Is it not working? No, you're good. You're just like the little bit. Oh. Like the reverb going on. Everybody, everybody look and see what they're doing there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we went to the uh, mall because there's an indoor playground and they had a, a little shopping to do. They were out of town and coming in to Daytona. And uh, so we're playing at the playground inside, and it's an area almost as big as this room. It's a pretty big playground. Uh, and my grandson walks over to me, and he's real serious, and he gets right next to me, and he leans on my, I'm sitting down, he leans on my legs, and he gets real close and real serious, and he goes, Grandfather, why does that boy not have a hand? And I look up, and there's a, <clears throat> There's a boy playing, running, jumping, and playing without a hand. He, he, from about the forearm down, you know. And here, you know, three years old, we start these questions early, right? I mean, I mean, I was kind of shocked that he would ask that question, but he was real serious. Why? Everybody say, why? 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 And, uh, you know, I wasn't really prepared for a theological theological discussion at the playground with my grandson. So I said, I said, Dietrich, that's really good of you to notice. It's really nice of you to notice that. And I, as a grandfather, I kind of hoped that would just blow him off and he'd go back and play. And he did. But I would say less than 30 seconds, maybe 20, 10, 20 seconds later, he comes right back, does the exact same thing, gets real quiet, leans on my leg and says, Grandfather, why doesn't he have a hand? Three years old. I think we start asking this question really early, and I think that this is a universal question. And of course, if you grew up in our day and age, I don't know about other ages, but if you grew up in our day and age, <clears throat> the most popular answer is, God made him that way. That's the most popular answer. And you might hear it in, you know, uh, uh, God is, has infinite wisdom, and he knows better than we do, and he's in control of all things. And you might hear these. These are kind of popular things today. <clears throat> and we're, we're saying God decided only one hand for you that he has some hidden purpose, he has some, uh, it's for his glory, or that he's teaching us or perfecting us. Now listen, I've been to Bible school, I've, did a, I've literally studied the Bible 30, 40,000 hours of my life. Have you ever done anything for 40,000 hours? Well, I've done that with the Bible. And this sounds good in theory, it sounds good in seminary, it sounds good in, you know, religious speaking think tanks. God's in control, it's for his glory. 
Now, what he didn't ask me, now listen now, what he didn't ask me was, can we overcome this adversity? He didn't ask me that. He wasn't really interested in that yet in life. He wanted to know what? Why? Why was of, was of interest to him. Can we overcome? This little boy certainly was overcoming. He was playing around. Matter of fact, while, while Dietrich was leaning on me, he came up and said, you want to play tag? And Dietrich goes, no. <laughs> he like answered like right away. No. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny. He just was like, no. So that's not the question I'm trying to answer today. Can man face any adversity? Amazingly so. Was this little boy amazing? His dad was sitting there amazing that their family would come together and overcome. Jesus said, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Do we have the ability to overcome? Yes, we do. But that's not the question I'm trying to answer today. That's not the original post of this conversation. Why? Basically what he was saying is I have two hands. My little brother has two hands. My mom and my dad have two hands. You have two hands, grandfather. How come that little boy doesn't have two hands. And our normal answer, well, he's special. God made him that way and he's special. But apply this to a real world. Let's apply this. Let's try and just be, you know, have some integrity and, and just be honest with ourselves and apply this in the real world. This is a world of people with two hands. Why does some little boy only have one? And this little boy has been told his whole life, now I don't know them, speaking in general terms, he's been told his whole life that you're special, that God picked you out. God took that hand for you, from you. And I'm saying in the real world, when that little boy is laying his head on his pillow at night and asking God, why did you do this to me? Why did you pick me? Why do I have to be the special one? Why couldn't some other little boy be the special one? And I'm submitting to you he feels the same way my grandson did, and that was he feels like he got cheated. He does not feel special at all. My little grandson knew that this little boy got cheated. Why? Why was his perfect health stolen from him? And in our text for the last couple of months, in our text, Jesus agrees with both my grandson and this little boy when he's alone and, and not listening to people with two hands. They know he got cheated. And I'm submitting to you today from our text, Jesus said they got cheated also, or he got cheated also. Look at our text. Jesus said, a thief stole it from him. And that's just the Bible. Uh, if, if you wonder what kind of church we have here, we just teach the Bible. I can't help it if it doesn't fit popular ideas. It's, it, Jesus is still Jesus. <laughs> and the last I checked, we follow him, right? We follow his teaching. Well, look at his teaching, John 10.10, King James Version. This is maybe the most important thing you could ever understand about God. Jesus himself speaking. The thief comes not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So Jesus would say, had I been a little bit more like him, 
I probably would have went, to, went into it, and one day when he's older, I can. But Jesus said, a thief did it. Isn't that what he said? A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. A thief did it. He said, as a matter of fact, by saying the thief did it, he's saying, I didn't do that. My father didn't do that. Listen, Jesus doesn't take little boys' hands. If you do that in the world, you know, there, you, literally, there's African warlords that that's what they do. And I, we know there couldn't be anything more evil than that. To have power to do that and then do it to a child. And we, and we say God does these things. But thank God Jesus came to show us what God was really like. And he said, I didn't do that. I challenge you, go home today. Read all four Gospels, everything that's in the Bible about Jesus, and see if he ever one time took anything from anybody. He didn't even, there's not even an experience there where he said, no, I won't give that back to you. I won't restore it to you. I won't heal you. There's not one case where Jesus said, oh, I, uh, we got to let that stand. Not once ever. Not once did he ever take responsibility for it or credit for it or blame and not once did he ever not overcome it not once ever he never told anyone I'm going to take this from you I can't heal you I can't restore you I can't make you whole why would I want to do that I gave that to you he never told anyone that had any imperfection in their life, I did that to you. Well, if Jesus doesn't take credit, why are we giving him credit for it? If he doesn't take the blame, why are we taking the blame or, or assigning the blame to him? Now, if, it, if that's the way he is, that's the way he is. I can't help it. If he says, man, I go around taking stuff from people, that, well, he's God and we're the clay. We just have to accept it. But thank God... He said, that's not me. I'm not doing that to anyone. Well, is he just trying to trick us? Is he, when he walked the earth, was he hiding his true nature? His true nature was taking stuff from people? Teaching them lessons? He said, that's not who I am. That's not why I came. I have nothing to do with that. Look at his work. The garden <clears throat> before sin, before Satan, was perfect. Even God said it was. He said, man, this is good. This is good here. <laughs> and then when this thief is removed, what happens? Perfection is restored. Isn't that interesting? God had nothing to do with it in the garden and nothing to do with it for eternity. He said, I came to heal, to restore. I'm telling you, folks, you've got to get used to God being perfect because he is perfect. And David, King David said, he only does wondrous things. That's all he does. He's not doing wondrous things and, and harmful things. He only does wondrous things. Psalm 78, 18. Proverbs said, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Jesus said himself in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew uh, 5, he said, Be ye perfect, even as your Father is perfect. James said this, James 1, 7 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Now, we're all in the same boat here, folks. And if we've ever experienced, which we all have, any tragedy or any imperfection here, doesn't mean I am worse than you or you're worse than me or that little boy's worse than all of us. It has nothing to do with that. A thief doesn't just steal from bad people. <laughs> He'll steal from anyone he can. <laughs> 
But Jesus said he's not content to just steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you eternally. And we won't even acknowledge he's here or doing this stuff. I submit to you that we're all in this together with Jesus against him, against this thief. This thief came and stole our perfect life that God gave us and will restore back to us one day. That's what Jesus came to do. So that was my second answer for my grandson, is I just, I jumped over all the theological stuff and I just said, Jesus has him one uh, in heaven. And that, that seemed to suffice him and he took off, never came back. We haven't seen him since. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> He's, he just was playing. <laughs> so the scriptures say our ministry then is the same as his ministry. We're supposed to take back all that this thief has stolen from mankind. One imperfect situation at a time. Jesus said this, when a strong man locks up his stuff, it's protected. But then a stronger than him comes along kicks down his door, and takes his stuff back. That's what Jesus did. And he said, Rick, you go do the same that I've done. You go take all that stuff back. He has no right. Thieves have no right. So in this series for the last couple of months, we've been talking about we take it all back by faith or with faith. 1 John 5, 4 says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith four times. The Bible says we shall walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says that we cannot even please God without faith. And it goes on to say whatever is not faith is sin. So I don't know about you, but based on that, that seems like faith's pretty important stuff. Pretty important to God. So in our conversation, when I'm talking about faith, I'm not talking about that fact that you love Jesus. Wonderful. I'm glad you love him. I'm not talking about you believe in him. You believe him to save you. Wonderful. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the fact that you love to worship him. Wonderful. I believe in that too. I'm not talking about the fact that you've forsaken all you have to follow him. The disciples did all those things. Yet Jesus said, where's your faith? Oh, you have little faith. Why, why aren't you using your faith like I do? So I'm talking about something completely different from the normal Christian experience. <laughs> Living by faith. The way Jesus did. So today, and the rest of our time here, we're going to get a specific part of faith. What I like to do is kind of break it all down and break it down to a couple of specific things that we can maybe implement or start practicing in our life. And so if we want to begin to live by faith, today the specific part of faith is I want you to begin to practice. First, you've got to see it in the Scripture, but to begin to practice believing what you say happens. Now, this is some wild stuff. It, it may not even make any sense. But according to the teaching of Jesus, believe, the person of faith, believe what you say happens. Let's look at this in Scripture. All right. So Jesus, I, lo I love when Jesus gives us a how-to. You know, he doesn't just say, go do something. He actually shows you how to do it. So here, when the, when the Bible says four times, live by faith, live by faith, live by faith, live by faith, Jesus said, okay, today I'm going to show you how to do that. So in Mark 11:22, have faith in God. Now the context is he, had, he was coming into town and there was a fig tree without figs and he said, no man, eat fruit from you forever. And then they went into town, did their business, they came back that night, didn't seem like anything changed. And then the next morning, they're going back into the city. And Peter remarks and he says, Master, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And they're all like, wow. How, how many of you know, generally speaking, a tree doesn't die in 24 hours? Completely withered from the root up, he said. And this was Jesus' answer. I'm gonna, not only did I do that, 
I'm going to show you how to do it. Amen. In another place he said, if you had faith, you could say unto this sycamine tree, be uprooted, fly through the air, cast into the ocean, and it would obey you because, this is what he said, nothing is impossible Amen. unto you. Amen. He's like thinking way different than we think. So he's going to teach us. And I'm submitting to you today, there are four words here that we need to get. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. After the word heart, shall not doubt in his heart, after the word heart, if you look this up in the Greek, you'll find out that there's only four words, four Greek words. And the four Greek words are these. Believe, say, happen, and you. Believe, no, not you. Believe what? Believe, what, say, happen. That's the only four words that are there. Now, King James adds quite a few words, but I don't think they go get away from the from the intent, but in the Greek, believe what say happens. And then it's implied, he's talking to you, so we can add that word, believe what you say happens. Amen. Let's all say it together. Believe what you say happens. Did Jesus say it? It looks like he said it. <laughs> Four words. They couldn't get it too much wrong. Uh, hey boys, you want to learn to live by faith like I did? You want to you want to speak to trees and speak to mountains? You want to uh, overcome these imperfections that are here and things standing in your way? He said, I'm going to show you how to do it. We, we're going to start right here. Believe what you say happens. Now listen. This is the first thing I learned about this. If I really believe what I say happens, I'm going to have to change a lot of what I'm saying. I'm going to have to stop saying certain things. I'm going to have to talk differently. That's what Jesus said. It starts when you change your words. You're going to walk by faith? I, it's wonderful that you believe in Jesus and love Jesus and worship Jesus and follow him and forsake all for him. It's wonderful. But if you're going to live by faith, starting today, you're going to change what you say. That's what he said. Change what you say. Verse 23. Say unto this mountain. Now this is pretty wild. He didn't say say unto God, say unto your neighbor, your family, your friends. He said to speak to the imperfection or the situation or the mountain. He said to speak to it. This makes no sense. Everybody say weird. weird. This is weird stuff. This is weird stuff. If, if you're just too much in your own mind, you know, you, people talk about being in their own feelings. Well, if you're just in your own mind, this will make no sense to you. Talk to mountains. Talk to trees. Talk to wind and waves. Speak to bodies. <laughs> even to dead bodies. This is what Jesus did. Speak to any imperfection standing in your way? He said, speak to it. So listen, so as a person of faith, what I began to do was, I can't talk about it anymore. That mountain standing there, I can't talk about that anymore. That imperfection that's standing between me and what God has given me, abundant life and life itself and, and perfected life, I can't talk about that anymore. Whatever that situation is, whatever that case, whatever that imperfection here, I can only talk to it if I'm going to follow Jesus. That's all we're talking about is following Jesus. So I'm going to talk to it and I'm going to tell it, be removed and be cast into the sea. That's what he said to do. Or another way to say it would be, to tell it, you're talking to it, tell it what you want to see happen. Tell your imperfection 
what you want it to do. This is weird stuff. It, it, and it will feel weird. It will sound strange at first. You'll have a hard time even doing it. I recommend doing it by yourself because it's embarrassing. People think you're crazy. If you like, if you like lived with Nina, you'd literally just think she was crazy. She's like talking this stuff all the time. I'm a little more refined. I'm a little more private. She don't care. Who hears her? Begin, if you want to live by faith, begin to listen to your words. Words have meaning. They mean something. They have power. They have power to change things. Nothing else has words. Nothing else in creation on this earth has words. We're the only ones with words. Words mean something. Listen to your words. Begin to listen. See, because if I believe what I say happens, why would I talk about anything that I don't want to happen or that I don't want to keep happening? Because I believe what I say happens. I'm going to watch what I say. <laughs> I'm going to begin to monitor my words. You say, well, none of my friends do this. And I'm thinking, well, maybe you need new friends. Amen. People that know how to live by faith. There weren't a lot of them, right? Jesus picked 12, and for three years, he was saying... You don't have any faith. You don't have any faith. You don't have any faith. You're going to have to get this. You're going to have to learn faith. And they're all consumed about all kinds of stuff, right? Who's the greatest? It's like, oh, how long do I have to be with you guys, you know, <laughs> before you learn how to live by faith? Jesus would ask us, why aren't you using your faith? Why don't you use your faith? Or you could say it this way. Why don't you take back what that thief has stole from you? Why don't you take that back? Why are you letting him take that and keep it? Then in verse 23, he says, and not doubt in your heart. And, uh, and uh, actually, uh, stay with me. We're, we're starting to wind down. Not doubt in your heart. especially while you're speaking to these things, these imperfections. Not doubt in your heart. Uh, the Greek says to not be divided in one's mind. James says don't be divided in your words either. Another uh, translation says waver. And he says none, ever, not doubt. So in the last time we have here, uh, the remaining time, we want to talk about how to remove doubt then because I can't have doubt while I'm walking in faith. I can't have Never, ever, one bit of doubt. And here's how to remove doubt. And shall not, right in the middle, doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. You want to overcome doubt in your life? Begin to practice believing what I say happens. Practice that. I believe what I say happens. And then, basically, I just monitor my words all day. I can't say that. can't say that. You say, how, how long or how often do I get to do that? Forever. This is how God lives. He created the worlds by faith. This is him. This is how he lives. He never doubts about anything. Doubt knocks on your, on your door, on your mind. Just say, no, thank you. I'm going to believe what I say happens. I believe my words matter. I believe my words make a difference. I believe my words have the power to change situations. You say, why do you believe that? The Bible. This is, this is literally the Bible. Say, well, I never heard that. Well, 
I can't help people don't preach the Bible. That's not my problem. But it is the Bible. So let's apply it. Let's apply it. We can apply it. The first place I'd like to apply it, apply this kind of faith, believing what I say happens is to other people. Watch what you say about other people. You ever heard this phrase, I can't stand so-and-so. Well, if you begin to believe what you say happens, and you can't, then you say, I can't stand them, you just fall down. Can't stand. Instead of the, you know, the fake smile we give. Jesus said this. He said to love your enemies. Apply faith. This takes faith to do this. He said to bless those who curse you. To do good for those who use you or abuse you. To pray for those who persecute you. And I'm telling you, I don't think we do that until we learn to believe what we say happens. Until we learn that, oh, my words matter. My words can change things, can change situations. My words make a difference. Second area, run, run right through these. Second area, apply this faith to abundance or abundant life. He said, he said I've come to give you abundant life. So any non-abundant area, let's just use lack, mountains of debt, I've seen those before, need, provision, we've fed the homeless for uh, almost eight years, there's a lot of need in people's lives, lack of provision, any imperfect situation, financial situation, or work situation, begin to watch what we say about it. Jesus said to actually speak to it, be removed, be cast into the sea. I have abundance. I have abundant life. I have all sufficiency in all things. I'm thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And you can begin to study the scriptures on it and you'll find hundreds of them. Hundreds. Me, as, as a minister, I, I work at this. And I've confessed these last few months of how I let my faith slip. And I repented and I changed my words. I was not saying the right thing. I was saying stuff like this. The truth runs people off. That's a silly thing to say if you're a preacher. Because you're supposed to be preaching the truth. <laughs> then I looked in the Bible and I saw, well, no, wait a minute. It, it did run some people off, but multitudes gladly would come hear Jesus. Multitudes want eternal life. They want to learn to live by faith. They want to kick down the door and take back what has been stolen from them. They want the, their imperfections healed and to overcome the thief. Multitudes want that. So you can apply it to other people. You can apply it to provision or, or your work. Uh, last one, apply it to a healthy body or health in your body. Do not let the thief steal your perfect health from you. See, now, if I believe what I say happens, I'm going to stop and I'm going to watch, I'm going to monitor what I say. I literally heard this the other day, and, and, and I was being kind and sincere and it, there were other people there, so I didn't, I didn't feel it was time to get into this. But they, the, this person said, I have pain all over my body, every joint. And the doctor said, there's nothing that can be done. And that's what they said. Well, anybody that would say that, you can't believe what you say happens, right? You're not, you can't believe your words. You can't believe your words have any power to move mountains or to change things and say those words. You, you couldn't say those words ever again, you know. Here's some words we could say. I have healing taking place all over my body. Amen. That's more in line with what Jesus did. <laughs> my body's pain-free and I'm in perfect health. By his stripes I am healed. Nina has for years... She had some ill health, and for years she listened to a, a, a back in the day we'd call it a tape, but it's, it's just a, a file, an audio file, of just scripture about healing being taught. And it was about, a, what, an hour long? And she listened to that, probably listened to it hundreds of times. It's the Bible. I think it's Psalms. 
said he sent his word and healed them. We use faith to take back what's been stolen. All right, I'm just going to introduce this and then we're going to stop. This is a great story. We'll read this story and I think I'll pick up here next week. Mark 5, 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. One of the greatest stories in the Bible. Jesus was so impressed with this woman after 12 years. Let's say those words together. After 12 years, not of, of staying the same, not of some good days, some bad days, 12 years of getting worse every day. My situation is worse today than it was yesterday. 12 years. She'd been stolen from. And Jesus was so, uh, had so much admi admiration for this woman and respect for this woman. He said, you know what? I'm going to put this story in the book. I'm going to tell the whole world what you did here. Because this is not common to be in a condition for 12 years. And she got out of it immediately. That's what God does. He didn't do the 12 years. He did the restoration. He did the healing. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen. Are you going to share? Yeah. After that one? Oh, yeah. Ah. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, well, when my husband's preaching this kind of faith message, for those of you who know me, I, I, I have to share a few things. So Matthew 10, 8 says this, Heal the sick. This is Jesus speaking. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils freely. You have received. Freely give. I've had a number of, like he said, health issues in my life, and I have practiced the word of God just as, like my sister I have spoken the word of God over my body. Uh, a few years ago, I had, I had been in the hospital many times for heart. Uh, not heart disease, uh, mainly um, fluctuations and just, you know, different palpitations and stuff. So I went through that. And then a few years ago, uh, it was happening again, and I went to our Ponsonlet, thank the Lord for them, the, uh, I had Rick drive me. I didn't want the truck coming to the house. I'm like, just drive me. So I walk up, and my heart's uh, probably within 30, 40, 35 to 40 of the heartbeat. It was like up and down, 35, 40. And they're looking at me like, you should not be coherent. But I'm talking, and I'm walking. And so they said, do you want to go to the hospital? And again, that's probably my 10th time or whatever. And I said, yes, I'll go. Uh, I would like to just... I would like to go, but I was more in faith. I was practicing the word of God again in my life. I was speaking the word of God, of healing over my body. And so anyways, um, so they take me, so on and so forth, don't want to go through the whole thing, but monitoring, and uh, at one point, the paramedic thought he was going to lose me in the truck, and he, he was all nervous, he was like grabbing, like, and I was fine, I was talking, I wasn't passed out or anything, and he's like all like, and, and he gave me medicine. The hospital didn't really want him to give me that medicine because they wanted to monitor me, but so they had to wait till that medicine wore off. Long story short, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and uh, the nurses came in, and they're looking at my, uh, you know, my vitals, and they're freaked out. They're like, we got to call the heart doctor, and it's 2.30 in the morning. So they did. They called him. He said, she's walking and talking, using the commode by herself, She's up and about, but her heart rate's very, very low, very in a dangerous zone. And they're like, yep. He said, just leave her be, let her rest. I'll see her in the morning. Well, uh, and then another, another, doc, another nurse came in, a male nurse, same thing. He was freaked out. And so long story short, the doctor does come in. Normally they don't get there till like 9.30, 10. He got there at 7.30 with his assistant. He's like, what's going on with this woman? I have many miracle stories, but I'm just telling you this one. And so um, 
uh, you know, they did the tests. I knew it wasn't heart disease. I knew that wasn't the issue. I knew it was electrical, so on and so forth. So to, to release me, my, my, my uh, heart rate was still very low, and it would go up and down. It w I watched the machine. It would literally constantly go up and down. So uh, one of the nurses came in, and she just like, it's almost like Powerball or something. She just picked a number at 54, and they released me at 54. I knew it still wasn't right. So we got home, and uh, again, this is just one story out of many in my life, in my family's life, of real Bible miracle healings according to the Word of God. So I, I get home. We're sitting, I'm sitting on the couch. Rick's sitting on a chair to my right, not far from me, and I'm sitting on the couch. I'm going to say it a little louder, but I prayed this prayer. I practiced what she said. Do you, do you actually know what she said? She said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. So, and I knew this. I understood the word of God because I'd lived this way for many years. I've been serving Jesus for 40 plus years. So I'm sitting on the couch and I said this prayer very quietly, but I'm going to say it louder so you can hear me. I said this. I said, I thank you, Father, that I have healthy heart rhythm." And my heart literally went like that, back to normal. Their medicine couldn't do it. Pharmacia doesn't cure. I have nothing against doctors and nurses. My father was a paramedic. My stepmother was a nurse. But one thing about pharmacia, I'm talking pharmacia. You have to look in the Bible about that. It doesn't cure what Jesus Christ does. So one more story. This was more recent. We were temporarily staying at our son's house, which is our boy's legacy house. Yay! Praise the Lord. Amen. So the children, our grandkids were very ill, and I had gotten it, and I was losing lots of fluids, and I wasn't able to replace them all, and I wasn't able to eat. So one night, uh, I had to wake Rick up because I used the commode, I used the restroom, and I felt very like I was going to pass out. And I woke Rick up. I said, Rick, I said, you, you have to, something's very wrong. And this was just a couple months ago. And so, again, this was because of the illness and so on and so forth uh, that goes through a house <laughs> when that happens. And um, I went to the restroom. I came back. I felt like I was going to pass out, but I made it back to the bed, and I said, Rick, something's really wrong. He woke up. I said, I need an applesauce because I eat applesauce a lot of applesauce, no sugar applesauce for my, for my healthy diet. And uh, so he got up, and in this little apartment where the boys will live, uh, he walked over to the cupboard, and he said he watched me. He said he heard me exhale very loudly. And then he said he heard me exhale again. And he said I slowly went on my back. He said that's not good. He wasn't in fear. He's a man of faith. And he walked over, and he put his hand on my chest. I don't remember this part. This is what he told me. He put his hand on my chest, and he said, Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I sat up. And as I was sitting up, I felt his hand on my chest. It was warm. And I, I sat up. I go, I must have fallen asleep. I really thought I fell asleep. You really do fall asleep. It is a sleep the Bible talks about. So anyway, so he didn't tell me anything. So I said, I think I, I need to go to the ER only because I knew I needed um, uh, intravenous. I needed IV. So, but I didn't want to go because I've already been there a billion times, and I just didn't want to go through that. Anybody who's ever been there in the ER, you just, it's like, okay, I, no, all right. So he said, I wonder if Brandy has Pedialyte. So I said, check the cupboard, because the cupboard was just out that one door, and he checked it, and it was called kin it's called Kinder Light. I highly recommend every home to have a bottle of Kinder Light, okay? It's the fastest liquid IV that you can have. So it was strawberry, so he poured it for me. I began to drink it, and I started to feel better. I started preaching to him. I was like preaching, because this is what I do, you know? He does it too, but I do it way more. But anyway, so... Uh, and he's like, he's like, okay, you need to get some rest. So I lay down. So he watched me. Like, I'd look up, and he'd be looking at me. Every time I moved, he would be looking at me. So the next morning, I told him, you know, yeah, I, I must have fell asleep. He goes, I got to tell you what happened. He said, I could not feel your heartbeat, and you weren't breathing. 
We're people of faith. We've known about Jesus and his words. And in, like I said, Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick. Jesus said this to us. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Where does that come from? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, power, words, power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of. Who's that thief? The devil. For God was with him. The same Jesus, the Bible says, he's the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he's the same forever. The Lord says in Malachi, I am the Lord, I do not change. This is not strange. This is who God is. This is how he lives. And he wants to encourage you that you can live by this faith. If you will hear him, if you'll receive what he says, and if you'll believe it, and you begin to speak it. So it's not a joke. It's real, and it's powerful. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We ask that everybody, uh, you can give to ponchchurch.com. You can give to littlecitychurch.org for those of you in Pennsylvania. And we do receive our offering at the front table. Thanks for coming, and you may be dismissed.